So what time is it over there? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Why oh, you guys are staying after hours? Appreciate uh, the <laughs> good. What what what's the what's the usual work day in Romania? Uh, uh, some people I, and guys, colleagues, correct me if I'm wrong, but for some colleagues there is uh, nine to six, and for others like seven, uh, ten to seven p.m. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. All right, and on your mark, I'll wait or wait for you. Tell me, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andre. Am I saying it right, Andre or Andre? Or Andre. Andre. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe we can start. Uh, the session is recorded, so. Okay, you're going yep. on YouTube. Don't share anything uh, internal. We'll say that much. <laughs> yep. All right. Go ahead, Andre. I'll let you kick it off. Yeah. So. Hello everyone. Uh, today we have a special guest. Uh, it's uh, Hassan Habib, uh, and uh, he and correct me if I'm wrong. He just released, uh, and when I say just, like for like uh, for uh, three four months, uh, a book. Yeah, the standard. It's an uh, architecture book. Uh, it uh, it has some uh, interesting concepts in it, and uh, we thought of sending him an email and maybe he can present us a session about it and and thank you uh, you accepted it and now we, we are here uh, yeah. so I will give it to you if you want and we can start maybe present yeah. some important concepts so yeah thank absolutely you. yeah yeah absolutely uh, so just to, just a little a little bit about myself I've been in my name is Hassan I've been in the tech industry for about 22 years now and uh, these days I'm working as an engineering manager in the mixed reality organization for HoloLens. And, uh, you know, a part of, you know, a, bite, a part of my journey in the tech industry is to be able to make software engineering enjoyable, simple, enjoyable, predictable, right? Uh, you know, growing up in the tech industry, I've had to deal with all kinds of, you know, different people. Like some people would come in and be like, you know, Hassan, to be honest with you, this, this software engineering is not not for you right it's too complicated and you seem to kind of you know struggle with 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 some of the concepts that we're trying to present and then i thought to myself okay i have two paths right i could just quit it all you know and just go do something else or i could make it simpler for myself right so i said if something can can fit in my head it probably can fit in anyone's head you know i can just you know look at these concepts and how software engineering is being taught how software engineering is 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 being uh, practiced and perceived and i can make it simple for anybody to just come in and be able to kind of understand and be able to be productive from day one right and that's kind of a big big challenge because you know some things in software engineering are just kind of the things that kind of you know is 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 too complicated to understand something like monad for instance right you know once you understand monad you know you can't explain it that's the thing about it so um i took the challenge i said i said to myself okay there are some things that are uh, 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 you know, have potential to be simplified. A lot of people can basically look at it and 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 make it simpler for anybody. And there are some other things that need to be completely reconceptualized, right? There are some 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 models and some ideas and some patterns that we can just sit down and be like, why are we doing it this way? Why are we creating this much complication in our systems when it can be so much simpler? But then I have to tell you something, you know, uh, you know how when you're growing in your craft and in your industry, you know, you start to talk to more and more people somewhat at your level or higher than your level. Most of my uh, engagements is with people who are new to the industry or have a lot less experience in the industry. Someone that just came in like a year or two ago and they're starting to kind of work with the systems. And these folks are the folks that I actually learn from because these folks are the, the folks that can tell me, you know, whether uh, I am way too high in my ivory tower. I'm, you know, my concepts are harder to understand and they're not mainstream anymore, you know, versus, oh, this concept is actually really easy to build and really easy to understand. Working with people that are new in the tech industry, you know, people that are entry level interns, people from from all these kind of backgrounds, you know, help me a lot to kind of pick up really complicated topics and just simplify them and make them available to everybody. Here's the deal. I'm going to show you, uh, uh, you know, the standard basically, you know, if, if you took a look at the introduction of the standard, 
it basically says this. This is a book that will always be in draft mode and it's forever evolving. It's forever growing. It's open source sitting there on GitHub. So go out there. And now there's a lot of translations. Like I raised my hand and I said, hey, hey guys, can you help me out? Translate the standard. And 12 people showed up from different parts around the world we have bulgarian we have italian and french and arabic all kinds of different languages you know out there we don't have romanian though so if you feel like translating the standard to romanian by all means go ahead and you know usually what i tell people is if you can translate the standard you know to the to any language i will you know once you're done i will print your name on it and send 1001 copies to the a poor school in your country whatever that whatever that is but let me just kind of simplify the you know, or explain, you know, how the standard works with a lot of the teams that I've been working with and a lot of the people that are, you know, engaged with me. How can I actually, like I was just talking to my buddy, Josh McCall, and he said to me, you know, I learned the standard and some other guy that I've never met learned the standard. And then this hackathon, I brought them both together and they just started writing code from day one. He said, it felt like we've been working together on the same team for a long time. Right. How can you kind of achieve something like that? It's a kind of a magical interaction that makes us productive, but also makes the engineers happy, which is the ultimate uh, kind of concept or the ultimate aspect of this of this standard. When thinking about software, you know, design and requirements, the first thing that's going to come to you, any software engineer that's working out there, the first thing, you know, that starts that comes to them uh, is to basically get a requirement. Right. So you're getting a requirement. And the requirement is like, hey, we, we need to build some feature or some system. So I'm just going to put a simple requirement for everybody here to just take a look at. Here's a requirement. And this requirement is, uh, you know, we want a schooling system, right, to allow students to enroll in, in uh, courses, just like that, right? If, if the requirements, that's day one, if the requirement is not that simple, and it's not that clear, that means you and your program manager or you and your manager need to still work a little bit further to bring it down to simple terms. Now watch this. If you pick up just the uh, the nouns in this system, so I'm just gonna pick up the nouns in here and I'm gonna mark them in green. And tell me if you can't see it for whatever reason, you know, I can I can change the colors and all that. So here's a system, schooling system, and you have students, this is another noun, Right. And there are courses. That's another noun, just like that. OK. And then if you look at the verbs in here, you have enroll. Right. So that's a verb. In blue. And also there is allow. That's also in blue. Now watch this magic. If you pick up the nouns in this simple requirement and turn them into entities. So now I have a schooling system like this and I have a student and I have a course like this now all of a sudden you now extracted the actors right the models and then if you look at the verbs the verbs describe the interactions so the system will allow the student and the student will enroll in the course right so there are students so this is in here the interaction there is a, uh, allow in here and there is enroll like this, right? So just like that, I basically formalized, you know, a, a requirement, a raw requirement into something that software engineers can look at in a formalized way and be able to go and implement, right? So where do we go from here? If you figure out the requirement, if the requirement is clear and you can extract a simple model like this, every requirement out there, and, and, and you'll see me talking about this a lot in the standard, I talk about something called the tri-nature of things, like how everything out there is purposes, models, and simulations. Even us, like in here, us talking to each other right now, we have a purpose. We want to learn about the standard, and then there is me and Andre and everyone here. So these are the actors. And then the stuff that I'm saying, the learning and teaching and, you know, kind of interaction process, that's the, you know, simulation that happens everywhere. Every system in the universe that you're going to look at is going to have these three components, right? And they kind of interact with each other in one way or another. Okay, so the purpose, I have the purpose here. I want to build a schooling system. So that's my purpose right and you have the uh the requirement and all that kind of good stuff kind of going on there okay how do you turn that into software right 
looking at every system out there, you know, I realized whether this system is a biological system like us, a human being or an airplane or, you know, an Xbox controller, whatever that system is, I found out that every system out there com is comprised of either dependencies or purposes or exposures. What that basically means is that we as human beings, we rely on food. So that's a dependency for us. And we have a purpose. Maybe I want to be, you know, I want to build a, an, an, a system or I'm an engineer. So I have a certain purpose. And there's also exposure. Exposure is how others get to interact with us, right? So for instance, your resume is an exposure layer. When you have a resume, that's an exposure layer. You're basically going and saying, come look at me and see what I can do for you, right? When you walk up to someone, and you say to them, hello, how are you? My name is Hassan and I know about X, Y, Z. That's your exposure layer. You're basically allowing you as a system to communicate with another system, okay? If you think in these terms, this is what I call the tri nature of everything. You know, if you think in these simple terms, you can literally develop the most complex systems in the world. And I have, you know, and it wouldn't feel like you're uh, impacted in any way, shape, or form by the complexity of these systems. For instance, this requirement that I have up there, right? I can take that requirement and say, okay, I have a student that wants to enroll in a course. So that means I need a, 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 an, a, a dependency, something to talk to a database that tells me here is my uh, a student storage broker and I have a course storage broker. A broker is basically the that thin layer between your system and the outside world, right? So ideally you have a little database or databases sitting behind your system where this broker is basically is uh, in ownership of the configuration and all the details that you need, you know, to kind of interact with this storage system. But I also have a purpose, right? And your purpose here is to be able to go and say, well, I need something that goes, so let's say you have a student orchestration service. Let's call it student registration, orchestration service, right? And this student registration goes, look at this single responsibility kind of implementation. It goes and says, verify this student and then go register them in that course. See how simple this is? And then I need a controller. If you're building an API or a UI, I need a controller sitting up here that says student registrations controller, just like that. If you break every problem, no matter how complicated that problem is, into these three pieces, you'll be able to build some of the most complicated systems in the world. And the reason for that is, is because the system is fractal. What I mean by that is that the system repeats itself upwards and downwards. What that means is that this little microservice, let's just say this is a little microservice that we're building. Okay, so you put this in an app service. Let's say we put all these components here in an app service like this, and I'm putting it behind the scenes. That means that I have this dependency here, which is basically another team in Azure that's handling all your SQL servers and all that kind of stuff like that. And that means that someone is going to come at some point and build a UI in front of this. And this UI is going to interact with your system. So look, even inside the system, like if the red is the dependencies and the green is the purposes and the blue is the exposure, if you zoom out a little bit, you'll find out that the same pattern repeats itself here. So this becomes the red, this becomes the green, and this becomes the blue. And it keeps going on and on and on like this. Like if you look at us as organizations in, inside Microsoft, you'll see the Azure team is a depend, uh, the Azure organization is a dependency commerce organization and commerce organization is a dependence for store organizations where they be, when you go basically microsoft.com right this pattern is not just for software like everything around you is like that right you know the sun you know feeds the grass the grass being you know the the grasshopper basically eats from the grass and then a frog eats the you know the bug and and so on and so forth right like this whole system that we're in and so are we like we are dependent on people and other people are dependent on us whether we know it or not sometimes the dependency doesn't have to be what i call hardwired like not food dependency or anything like that it could be emotional dependency it could be intellectual dependency like if you're a mentor to someone, you are a dependency for this someone on the intellectual realm. There's physical, intellectual, and a spiritual realm, you know, and we're always feeding ourselves from these dependencies. And then we provide the same capabilities and the same kind of support to other things or systems or living beings. I'll take a second here. I throw a lot of stuff at you in like 10 minutes. So any questions so far before I go further?
One question regarding the the broker piece. Is mm -hmm. this the, the broker? Is it intending like a, a data access uh, a layer, basically yes. a typical Dell? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Because you know, usually the broker it's it's a place where you might have also some logic in it, right? You might have some. I mean, but I I take that the logic it's inside the controller, right? Not the broker itself. Broker, Actually. Actually, yeah. neither, neither the broker neither. or the controller. And I'll tell you about that in a second. That's a problem in the MVC pattern, but I'm sorry, go ahead, finish first, go ahead. No, no, th th that was a question, thank you. Yep, yep, absolutely. So for the longest of time, you know, you know, growing up through the 90s, going into the 2000s, I heard people say, oh, we have a repository pattern, we have data access layer, we have clients, you know, we have, the, they have all these names for technically basically the same thing. A, a liaison that sits between your application and the outside world and basically owns the configurations but does not have any business logic in it. It's meant to be an abstraction layer to keep that little guy in the middle, that little exposure, that little purpose layer completely abstracted away you know, from knowing whether you're talking to SQL or Cosmos or whatever you're talking to behind the scene, it doesn't need to know about that. Because ideally, these items that I'm gonna mark in purple should be disposable. You should just drop them. Like, let's say tomorrow we're not using RESTful APIs anymore and we're gonna use gRPC. This guy here in the middle should not change. Let's say one day instead of using SQL, I decided to use MySQL. This guy in the middle here does not change. What I basically say is that your system, a properly engineered system, should require, I'm not going to say no changes, but the least amount of change possible to be able to withstand ongoing changes in the tech industry. If you're building something for the next 10 years, you better build it in a way that you know SQL is not going to exist, Cosmos is not going to exist, there are going to be new things, there's always new things coming up you know, in the tech market, and you need to protect that business logic that's agnostic and abstract of whatever is happening around the scene, okay? Now, now that you brought this point, a lot of you might have heard about this pattern that says MVC, right? The MVC pattern, model view controller, right? MVC. This pattern, I struggled with this, uh, sorry, MVC. I struggled with this pattern a lot because I saw a lot of people put their business logic in here, in the controller, this this place that I'm just marked in uh, in blue, in here, they put logic here. Right. But then I realized, wait a second, if I put my logic in my controller and I go the next day and I want to I, I want to change from RESTful API to WCF or GRPC or whatever is out there, I'm screwed. Right. Because I have to kind of do an open heart surgery and kind of take that out. So I thought this model is actually incomplete. It's not not perfect. It's incomplete, which basically means we need an additional thing to go in the middle here that says whatever that model is. Whatever that exposure layer is, your your logic should not be changed in any way, shape, or form. It even simplified the testability of your system because you know the components that really, really matter and you want to write tests for it, and the components that really doesn't matter. It's just an exposure layer. It's such a protocol, right? It's like going and saying, here is a gift, and I'm putting a wrap around that gift. It's like putting an address on top of the gift, right? The address should not have the actual gift. The gift should be completely easily separable from the address and from the gift wrapping and all and everything else in between. Is that I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. So basically, the controller should be split, right? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, yeah. now on the broker level, you know, um, the reason why I chose to call it a broker, I'm trying to simplify again. Remember, like my journey is that I'm 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 not I failed high school twice. I'm not exactly the sharpest knife in the drawer, you know what I mean? So I needed to simplify things. I was like, why are we calling it 50 diff different things? There's utilities and commons and data access layer and repositories. I was like, are you just talking about the same thing which is a broker? that talks to the outside world, then let's just call them brokers. It could be a storage broker, it could be an API broker, it could be an email broker, it doesn't matter what it is. But when you say broker, engineers know, no business logic, abstraction, keep my external integrations away from my core business logic. That's all and that's it. Yeah, right. makes sense. But shouldn't be the broker abstracted even more? Like, I don't care what it does and I don't care if it's MySQL, if it's I don't know, yes. Cassandra or something else, right? Yes. Should it be another layer abstracting even the broker behind the scene? 
Right. So, so see, I, I always call them storage broker, right? The reason for that is that the language there is intentional because I don't want it to be even named after a particular technology. However, because it's fractal pattern, like it's just, it's just systems built upon systems upon systems. Like when you're building your ASP.NET Core API, right? It's built on top of the .NET framework, ASP.NET, maybe you're using mock and X unit to test it. So your system is just another layer on top of other smaller systems underneath it. These brokers normally like if you're if you're communicating with a SQL database, for instance, or a Cosmos database, of course, you're going to go and say, I want to rely on entity framework to communicate with my SQL server, right? But that's baked into your dependencies. And that's part of the idea of not having the logic, know anything about what dependencies your broker is using. Like if I pick up that broker itself and just like this, that broker itself is broken into your, in, in, in a real scenario, you'll have your entity framework as a dependency, and then you have your abstraction, right? And then the broker is exposing an API, and that's the API that your uh, foundation services are talking to. Watch this, the broker itself is broken into dependencies and purposes and exposures. Yeah. Like this, this little box in here is, is breaking underneath into more and more dependencies, purposes, and exposures, right? And so on and so forth. Just something like that. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions before we move on? All right. Okay. <clears throat> so this is, here's the idea. Imagine, just imagine a world where the internals of your smallest component in any given software system matches in terms of pattern the the biggest architecture that you have in your system so let's take this guy here and say this little piece here is one microservice and i'm going to break these microservices into a microservices architecture right and this microservices architecture will have what we call an orchestration an orchestration microservice that's sitting in front of this guy. And this guy now has brokers, but these brokers are not talking to the database. This microservice is talking to other microservices like this. Watch this. Like this, like this, like this. And let's say each one of these services are, you know, one of them is handling the billing and one of them is handling the customers and one of them is handling, you know, the addresses and whatever. And then in front of all of this, you have something like a gatekeeper. In microservices architecture, this is a very common pattern. You have something that's sitting on the front door of your architecture, and this front door of your architecture is the only point of contact between your microservices and your architecture. You don't want your clients to be tightly coupled or know about your internal microservices, so you can later go and change your architecture. So it's, it's really looking something like this. This is your architecture like this, like this, and it's basically saying, oh, I, I only know the exposure layer of this arc. I already gave it away and I said exposure layer, but, you know, it's basically the, the customers, the outside world is only interacting, interacting with your microservices architecture like that. Watch what I just did. One service became an exposure layer. Another service became the actual purpose. And these services in here became the dependencies for this guy to actually interact and communicate just like that. Okay, now imagine this on an organization level, it's actually multiple teams and multiple organizations that are talking to each other. I'm just showing you how uh, the pattern is repeating itself like this. So it's multiple team, like you're going and talking to Azure team and talking to, uh, 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 you know, I don't know, uh, office team or whatever, watch this. And now these organizations are talking to each other and communicating with each other upon the exact same pattern, just like that. See how this pattern is fractal. It's repeating itself. The more you go up or you go down, right, it's repeating itself. It's really important, though, that it's restricted by certain rules. Like, for instance, if you're building a service like this at the very bottom level, right, you can't go over than two or three. If you go more than three, you need to split further. You need to have more orchestration service and whatnot. Because every class, and remember this, I learned this, you know, a long time ago. If you really want to achieve 
true single responsibility, then every class you develop should either do the work or delegate the work, but not both. If your class is doing and delegating, you're doing something wrong. Right, because that basically means you're not really handling a single responsibility anymore. I have a question here from, is it yeah. Kostin? Kostin? Yeah, yeah, it's Kostin. Okay. Let me yeah. come on video. So um, here I see I see a problem with this architecture, right? There is a, right. a lot of potential duplication work, right? Okay. Uh, okay. Because it's each microservice, the way mm. you 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 describe it, might mm. have its own connection, might have its own broker behind the scene to the same database or and there is a lot of duplicated code multiplied. You said mm -hmm. actually replicated, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you think about this? How do you come to reuse and avoid mm -hmm. having ten thousand uh, teams doing mm -hmm. the same work over and over again? Absolutely. So so first of all, something something that I've seen people talk about all the time, and I really want to point out, you can't possibly have two microservices talking to the exact same database. This is a big violation in the microservices architecture. Why is that? Because if you do that, two problems will happen. The first problem is that they're gonna go into overwriting each other, right? The second problem is that service A could have completely different validation and business rules. Let me zoom in a little bit. The service A could have completely separate validation rules from business B, and then the suffering will become on the database itself because your data become extremely inconsistent, right? Because you have now two owners of that database. In microservices, what you wanna do, you wanna go and say, no, I have only one guardian per resource like this. And for this guardian, you can have as many microservices talking to that same guardian. And this way now you're handling, you know, nobody could override anybody. They're going the exact same rule and stuff like that. Go ahead, Andre, have your hands up. Sorry. I'll come back uh, to you in a second. Good, good, good. Yeah. So basically I just wanted to add here, but the, the basic idea is not uh, when two or multiple services share the same database data storage, basically you are sharing the data model and yes. to keep them in sync and everything that will be yes. a hassle and yes. everything. So you yes. can put an aggregator or, or a broker as Hassan said in front of it and expose that to the underlying services. And then there will be just one service yeah. which will own the data model. There's there's one more to this <clears throat> and then cost uh, I'll, 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 I'll give it back to you. I've seen some teams go and do something like this, right? They go and say, oh, since this uh, this service and this service are dealing with the same model, why don't I just go ahead and create a NuGet package, this magical NuGet package, and let's have this service use it, and let's have this service use it. What you just created is basically, let me, let me kind of, so here's the magical one, right? And let's have both of these services depend on this. Here's two problems with this approach. Every time you see someone propose something like this, ask them a question and say, what if I win and develop this in Python? Your NuGet package is useless now, number one, which basically means while the restful distributed systems is trying to tell you be technology agnostic, you just went ahead and created an anti-pattern where you went and said, no, you have to use .NET, you know, because there's this one magical NuGet package that you have to use, right? The other thing is, if you're distributing this system right, every one of these services will need to have its own fraction of that model that matters to them. So for instance, if this is the courses, if this is the courses microservice and this is the students microservice, the courses microservice doesn't care about the student attendance and the student uh, parent uh, contact or anything like that. They just need to know the student name and the student ID and that's it. But the same model that this API takes also takes more than that. So now it's not exactly a duplication of model. It's more like, give me the piece of the model that makes sense to my business logic, right? And if you're both of your services have the exact same model, then I start asking the question, should they be the same microservice? What are they doing? Why, do they, why are they using the exact same model? Something to that effect. Go ahead, Kostin. Yeah, but in general, I noticed that the architecture actually reflects the uh, organization, right? Right, so, right. Conway's so role, it, that's right. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. So yep. I, I see a lot of people, they build their own stuff, they connect and use similar data, they do similar stuff. Like mm -hmm. they connect to Custo. I mean, 
Custo itself, there is no other API layer. You just go uh, and query the same data, um, and they do the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I think that pattern is actually a problem uh, that mm -hmm. needs to be resolved, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people share code, uh, share mm -hmm. code, and they duplicate mm -hmm. that code. They copy the code to connect to Custo. They copy the code to connect to ICM. They copy the code to connect to anything. And just they just copy paste the code. Yeah, I I can talk about that for a second. This is actually a good yeah. this is actually a good problem. It's a good problem to have because it's it's a. Uh, so there is so there's the software that we build. A lot of software is is easy to write but very hard to understand and read. No matter how much patterns you follow, why? Like I asked myself for the longest time, why is it that I can write code in 10 minutes, but it takes someone else on the team a whole day to understand it, right? Why is that? I kept asking myself that question. And then I realized something. There is a big part of allowing other engineers on the team to grow and learn is to let them build these components with the basic understanding and the basic tooling that exists anywhere else in the world. What that basically means is that I worked at John Deere for a while where people had this habit of building uh, this utility libraries, right? And this utility library, you can't find it anywhere in the world. So it's doing something. It's internal in the artifactory. And when you pull that utility library, it will do the validation. It will do the thing. And then when you need to change something, you need to go back into the source code of that utility library and add another function. So it becomes the dumpster fire for all the things that the team is trying to do. It, it creates what I call in the standard entanglement. What that basically means is that if one thing changes in this library to fit one person's business logic, it breaks some 20 other libraries. I found out even though it's a good duplication, it's not duplication by the same person, which basically means that everyone on that team gets to learn and have the experience of connecting to Costo and maintaining that code. It, it creates ownership of that code because you wrote that. Even though it's identical to someone else's code, I would rather take that than creating single points of failure. Okay, so this is a situation with R9, basically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Uh, but if R9 is going to be changed, it's going to be a lot of pain for everyone, right? That, I'm sorry, did you say? R9, you know the library. You oh, know Dev, the R9? Dev9, I never heard of it. No, no, and, uh, R, R9. No, R9? I don't think Austin uh, Hassan might be aware of it. It is in oh. common consumption client SDK, Hassan, that mm -hmm. within M365 services, wherein when you want to use common things like Azure Key Vault, you want to mm -hmm. reach out to uh, uh, secrets from Azure Key Vault, you need mm -hmm. and uh, to access a certificate, you need mm -hmm. to access telemetry, you want to access, et cetera, et cetera. The common patterns are being abstracted into a common library that systems mm -hmm. can take a dependency into. To give you context. Uh -huh. I see. So so with all with all due respect, I would I would highly kind of object to that pattern because what it basically does is that okay, think about this. I'm a new engineer on your team, right? And you're giving me this magic library that does everything for me. That means if I step outside of this team and try to do anything with Key Vault, I can't find this 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 magic library that's out there. So I learned nothing, right? When while you think that you're making my life easy, you're actually creating a, a universe or an environment will people go in and out and learn nothing because they're like, well, there's this senior principal engineer that did all the work for me. I don't know how to connect with a key vault. And you see that a lot. You see an engineer that would come in and be like, I worked for 10 years in the tech industry, but he was working within that environment with everything was componentized to expedite the development process, but it actually makes the engineer pay very heavily for it when they just switch teams. Be like, I can't find any of these amazing libraries that we uh, had. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I believe, uh, so uh, the idea is like this, R, R9 is like a framework. It's uh, so yeah. You you made the example with uh, Key Vault, right? But uh, let's say high higher level languages is that when you are in .NET or writing .NET Java Python or something like that, you yep. you, you don't need to worry how to open a socket and right and uh, and all of those stuff. So it's it's, uh, it's a higher level, right? And yep. I believe R9 tries to be the same 
but with Azure services and I see. It, Microsoft internal services, trying to establish some best practices and so on. Right. Uh, in, in the end, Kamesh, costume, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how I see R9. I, there, there's a good, there's a good middle ground, right? Yeah. Instead, instead of making, if this library is super, super useful, open source it, so people can use it wherever they go. It, I believe some uh, parts of the R9 actually arrives in the .NET framework library. Okay. It's, it's integrated there. Okay. So if it's, so if it's out there, then we're good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I pasted the link to it, uh, Hassan, if you want to take a look. Uh, it's yeah. in the chat. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. quite well developed, and yeah. I think uh, it plays very well with... Uh, uh, the Cosmic Initiative. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it. The Cosmic uh, Initiative. Okay. I never heard of it. Teach never me. heard of it. Okay. Now, Kostin, so you are yeah. using terms that is people yeah. outside the N365 core will not be aware. <laughs> so. Okay. 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 Is, this, is, is, this is my yeah. point. You're in this universe, right? And you have all these <laughs> libraries that you know about. So, yeah. Kostin, if I, if I yeah. bring you over to Mixed Reality, right, you'll be like, Cosmic universe, be like, okay, what is that? <laughs> you know, yeah, but if I go, yeah. but if I go and tell you, hey, Key Vault SDK, you'll be like, yeah, I know where that is. It's public. Yes. I can go get it. That's yeah. the common language between engineers inside and outside. You know. Anyway. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Any other questions? Anything else? Or move on. Yeah. So, I'm to your point of saying R9 should be open source. I don't think it is yet. Uh, it might be the aspiration too uh -huh. premature to go get that, but eventually mm -hmm. we will get that. If you ever, if you ever need help open sourcing libraries and stuff like that. By the way, all my NuGet packages are open source, right? You know, when I build something, I always think of the next guy, the next engineer, right? If you want uh, to spread awareness of of certain practices, like I'm okay with creating libraries. That's great as long as you're going to make it available publicly. So the person that's working with you today can go and work in another team and they can pull the exact same libraries, right? One big problem is when people create their own internal artifactory, right? And unless it's proprietary, right? But if it's not proprietary, if it's a useful library, it's really, really important to put these things out there to expedite the development process. Let me tell you guys this, and this is really, really, this is from the heart. We have some of the smartest engineers, you know, inside Microsoft, people that have never seen anything like, you know, some people that scary people, they'll tell you how many takes a while loop versus a for loop would do some, some amazing things that they think about. Right. However, all of it is hidden internal right like once this person retires all of his legacy is gone we don't know anything about him we don't know what he did there's this unknown genius right that's sitting in every corner in every organization but their contributions is kind of behind the wraps and it's not even proprietary like i know someone out there is building an amazing uh, library to kind of pull uh, repositories from multiple uh, sorry, pull code from multiple repositories and then mush it all up and build it into one binary that you can take and run, you know, on any device. Why is that not open source, right? Why is something like that not open source? It's generic enough. It can run everywhere, right? This is the kind of stuff. The reason for that is, is because the product that we're working on will inevitably become a legacy. So libraries outlive products libraries the outlive products like if you go and build you know a simple library that communicate does the restful api communication the product that this library was built for will inevitably get, get sunset and another project will be built but the library would outlive it do you know what outlives a library concepts patterns and architecture that stuff that i was just talking about fractal patterns and you know you know breaking into dependencies and purposes and exposures right and this is where engineers in general should be focused on. What kind of pattern, what kind of philosophy do we want to follow? It's not enough to get things to work. Anybody can get something to work. We need it to work right and we need it to be pretty. And that last part is mandatory for me because if it's not pretty, it's not enticing. It's not easy to understand, you know, engineers on the team. By the way, just, just remember, bad code is a health hazard. Bad code could cause you mental issues and make you really, really sad and depressed and all that. So always think about that when you're writing your software. Think about the other person that's going to come in and look at your code. Always bring that intern or the new entry guy or the sweet one or two on your team. Tell them, hey, 
what do you think about this code? Please review my code. Tell me how simple my code is. Because if you do it this way, now your code will always stay at what I call level zero. It's understandable by the mass majority of engineers that will be looking at your code and inevitably maintain it. So you can go on vacation and the system doesn't fall apart. Otherwise, we're creating saviors on the team. Like if the guy is gone, the whole system falls apart. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I don't know. That's my experience. But anyway, questions, anything else? Yeah, so uh, to so the given a service, the first question I ask for anyone is at 2 a.m. It is scientifically proven between 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. Our uh -huh. cognitive aspects of our brains are non-functional if you go to bed. So uh -huh. the, the important bar that I use for my team is. Is this code can and can and half dead minded person wake up at 2 a.m. be able nice. to read the code, understand and make sense out of it because your cognitive thinking is dead. It's not functional. Uh -huh. I should uh -huh. be able to look at the code, read it, say, ah, this is doing <laughs> one plus one. This is adding a value to it, this is subtracting a value. <laughs> if it is not there, then that code does not pass the sniff test. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Oh my God, I never heard that before. I, that's nice. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I don't know if okay. you heard about uh, Uncle Bob's clean code, guys. Right? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it has some pretty nice things. Like, don't have yep. uh, it, it's it's like a constraint architecture. It's like uh, build your functions only with two uh, two parameters at top. Yeah, try, yep. try try using one. So I'll be on, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The standard is nothing but taking these solid principles and the things that Uncle Bob would say, and then took it to an actual enterprise. Take it to the John Deere's and Wells Vargas and Microsoft's and all these places around the world and say, how does it actually stand? And out of that came theories and came ideas and patterns that kind of like like clean code is talking about generic any code you could write. Right. The standard is telling you literally how to develop an architect, an enterprise application from idea to product, from storages to UI. So it's nothing but an application materialization of all of these ideas that we hear about all the time. Have you guys ever been reading a book or reading a YouTube video and it's talking about this amazing pattern, but then you ask yourself, well, where does it fit in the big picture? Like, how can I take that pattern and go to my team tomorrow morning? So I went on a plural site and I said, okay, there is this memento pattern, right? The memento pattern is basically an object that stores a copy of the last unmodified version of that very same object. You use it every day, you just don't know you do. When you open Notepad and you do Control Z, that, that undo, that's basically a memento object, an object that kept a copy of the previous object, right? How do I take that memento pattern and go to my team and tell them, let's put it in? In a lot of engineering teams today around the world, if you look at the architecture, it's like a mishmash of different patterns. They're not dancing together, right? on their own they look really good but when they put them together like this it's like putting chocolate on cheese i don't know is that i hope that's not something people people eat somewhere <laughs> you know i'm just trying to come up with an example just like you're putting chocolate and cheese right and you're saying okay this is this is a meal chocolate on its own is great cheese on its own is great mush them bo both together and then becomes a little bit a little bit interesting right um the, what I try to tell people is basically in order for you to come up with an architecture and a pattern, it has to be cohesive like an or orchestra. You're listening to an orchestra, everyone sitting in a corner, and they're trying to kind of, you know, play on the same tune at the same time so you can actually come up with a better result. That's basically what the standard is. Here's a system. How do I architect it? And, and, and it's really important. I have to show everyone this. Please go, you know, if you want to see, like I have a lot of open source projects, but for, for the purpose of this group, you know, it's really important for you to take a look at this project. And this is this is basically what my team has been working on in the last four months. I've been, only been here for a while. And this is our entire mixed reality infrastructure uh, code. Like I can I can sell you a big game, right? Anything that's written under DMX, right? This is one project right that you can go and take a look at and see these exact same principles that i just talked to you about you'll go into a project and you'll see here's our designs here's our api and then you'll look at brokers services and controllers and models and they they do exactly what you would expect it to we, we even have a date time broker like a broker that abstracts away reading time 
So you can actually test drive this and you can actually go and say, okay, this is, I want to retrieve all the labs, all the HoloLens labs from the system. How do I abstract that? Also really important. I know this is a not very common thing that people would go and take a look at, but look at how the team is pairing to develop these features. I don't have one person that does everything on the team. I have, you'll see the commit history of two people. One writes a failing test and the other person makes that same test pass. And then that same person writes a failing test and then the next person makes it pass. And then they write a failing test, pass. That's test driven development. Two people pairing together, writing code together. This means that you don't have saviors on the team. You don't have the one person that knows how the system works. You have at least two people at all times writing the same feature. When I first proposed this pattern and this kind of tradition on the team, people said, is this going to slow us down? But it paid off in the long run in a big, big way because now Terry can go on vacation and the person that paired with him, Michael, can go and say, yeah, I know how we built this. Right. And the code follows the same pattern. So I can literally pick up someone from the street that knows the engineering standard and they can come in and be able to contribute to the code day one. How about that? It's a dream, right? It's a big dream, right? But don't take my word for it. And, and Andre, I know you have your hands up. Don't take my word for it. Please go to this testimonial page. I basically made a survey and I asked everybody that ever worked with the engineering standard to tell me what they have to say about it. And I have this little page in here called the testimonial. This is people from every continent on the planet. There's a huge community and every continent on the planet go from uh, 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 America, Spain, Germany, England, Australia, all the way up to Namibia and India, all the way down to Uzbekistan and South Africa. See how they went through the standard. Some of the most, more junior engineers on the team, they said something like, the standard helped me transition from intimidated to empowered. Why is that? Because things started to make sense. Things are simple. I can understand it. I can come day one and not be scared. Oh my God, I'm not going to deliver this feature. It's been two months. What should I do? Right? Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, so I kind of have one. The link you provided, it's uh, the Outer Space Apes. Do we yes. need to log in with a Microsoft account? On you, GitHub? You, you, you do only to access like the Outer Space, but if I give you like the individual, let me give you the individual, like it's open source, like anybody can access it. This is like the team page, but if you go into this one here, try, oh, try, okay. to, try to access this one here directly and tell me if it works. You, yep. it, 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 try to even access it in like incognito mode. It should allow you to, to do so. Yeah, okay, okay. And uh, I have a second question. Let's say from, uh, from your experience, what are mm -hmm. the common mistakes that you identify, let's say in teams when they start building new products, new services and so on? Uh, rabbit holes, rabbit holes. You have to know the difference between we need to get something out the door versus we need to build something that is, uh, 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 I'll give you the example. Uh, for, for people that have been around for a while, how many times have you sat down and heard the discussion about which regular expression should we use to validate emails? A lot. And they go over and over. And then the next day someone comes in and be like, no, I found a better regular expression. The truth is there's no such thing as a perfect regular expression to validate emails because simply, you know, unless you actually know the email exists on the server and the email is structurally, you know, valid, you know, like if you go into ASP.NET Core, uh, sorry, ASP.NET uh, attributes for validating emails. Actually, I have to show you this because this is so hilarious and fun. Okay, everything you think you know, if you go to something called source.net and just type in their email attribute, email email address attribute this is how take a look at this function this is how when you put email attribute over a model that's back from the mvc days and some people still use that this is how it validates emails it says if the value is null then that's a valid email right how i don't know some people could say yeah. you know no e no email is an email and now we're talking about philosophy and some crazy stuff. But more important than this, if the email has at and it doesn't have .com or anything like that, it's valid because in some internal corporate places, you don't need the .com, right? But this is also a message for everyone out there, like don't take everything at face value. The people who wrote these libraries and the people that are writing these libraries are just us, it's just like us. 
you know, we're not perfect, right? But you also have to understand, like, you know, th the point that I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to put down anyone's code or anything. I'm just trying to tell you when you follow a certain pattern and you follow certain concepts, you can examine and see things a lot clearer. I have today on my team junior engineers that can look into some really complicated project and in their minds, they have the map. Okay, this is this code goes into brokers, this code stays in the service, and this code goes into exposure layer. And if you can have that power and hone that power, you know, it makes engineering fun and happy engineers produce some of the fastest best code ever made in the history of the planet. Go ahead, Andrew. I don't know if you have a legacy hand or that's a previous uh, question. Uh, I have another question on this. It's, uh, how do you deal with technical debt? Uh, do you, it's more like, let's say, management part of it. Do you assign a specific uh, I don't know, time for each iteration to deal with it or I'll what's tell you. That? Oh, okay. that's a oh, that's a beautiful question. So a while back, I introduced to the world something called and there's like a podcast about this, uh, something called Code Rub. Code Rub is basically a ritual that my engineering team does every day in the morning. They take 15 minutes, 15 minutes to look at the code base, even if there is no bugs or anything. And they basically go and say, give me 15 minutes or 10 minutes to take at a, to take a look at the code base and find something to fix. So this is regular daily thing. It also has a nice psychological impact on the engineers because every day you're creating pull requests. You will always be pushing code every day, right? Which makes engineers super happy, right? But more important than this is that, okay, you have 20 minutes, one file. You take a look at the file. You'll see this a lot in the code base that I just shared with you. Like if you look in here, you will notice that there is a lot of these things where people go and say, oh, code drop, I found a little uh, error. I found a little mistake, you know, in the spelling. I found, you'll see, see, code drop, edit, ask, task, according to the standard, remove unnecessary parentheses, all these little things. What does this do? It gives engineers happiness. They can write code, but also make sure that the project ends up with zero technical debt because it became a ritual. It's like a prayer every day. You know, you're waking up in the morning before you do stand up or anything. I'm looking at my code base and I'm fixing something. It also makes sure that the, the project doesn't go stale, like code doesn't rut because I'm also keeping everyone on their toes. I change the standard every couple of months. Like every couple of months I go and say, hey guys, new pattern. We're gonna do things this way now, <laughs> you know? And people are like, oh no, we have to go figure out how to do this and do the code and all that. It's always an improvement. So it keeps everyone learning. Here's the thing. Let me just tell you this, Andrew. Watching a plural site video about C Sharp doesn't make you an engineer. Reading a book doesn't make you an engineer. Unless I teach you something and then I tell you, here's a whole bunch of code base that you can practice on to upgrade to the new standard, you will never, ever, ever remember that practice. Right? Winston Churchill says this. He said, tell me about something I will forget. Right? Teach me something, maybe I'll remember. Have me do something, and I'll and I'll have it forever. I'll remember it forever, or something like that. I butchered it, but it's something to that effect, right? You know, you have to have people, engineers, actually do it by hand, and then go teach it. And then when they go teach it, it becomes a culture. It becomes a a a movement in a way, a good movement. Okay. Yep. Uh, I have a follow up question on the Kodra part. Uh, mm. the, um, Members of your team do uh, own some portion of the code, like some specific files, or do they buy rotation? So maybe it's uh, it's also a period to kind of understand the code base even better and so on. It's right. It's it's rotation. There is no ownership. We don't have ownership. Yeah. If I assign ownership to an engineer, that means I'm telling this engineer you can't you can't take vacation yeah, because true. your code base is not working. And sorry, it's Andre the one that knows it. We've seen this. You know how many times I've been to an organization where there is one person that knows about this code base and then this person leaves the company, right? And now we're stuck, right? Because they have all, this is what I call SAM, the savior model. That's it's actually another really important thing. So let's go here, you know, SAM. Take a look at this, um, Mr. SAM. Take a look at Mr. Sam article. I, I wrote that specifically about folks that you have a savior on the team. See, there's this one guy in the middle, right? And any pull request has to go through that guy because he owns this component. That's a very, very, very bad practice because if that person leaves the company, everyone's screwed because they don't know how to do it, right? 
All right. <laughs> Two minutes. Anything else? <laughs> Questions? Um, if I may, hey, one more question. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, go ahead, Kamesh. Go ahead. Yeah, Hassan. So I like what you said about. Uh, sorry, my camera is busted. I need to restart my camera. That's why I'm not able to come no online. Um, I like what you said, and I agree with what you said. Right, the developers have to adhere to the standard, otherwise the code becomes an uh, stinky pond that we have to drink water from every day. Right, that's the analogy. That <laughs> analogy right. I could use it. Right, it's a pond that we have to drink water from. You better keep uh -huh. it clean. Because uh -huh. that's what that day in day in service does, right? Yep. Rather than teaching and enforcing them to say do this way, do that way, I would take another another step forward, and I would say think Roslyn analyzer. If there are certain things that can bring and detect early and give you early warnings, as simple as the modern cars. When I am getting too close, it gives me a warning saying I'm approaching the vehicle too close. It gives me an real cue, loud cue by saying stop, you're going too fast. Similarly, mm -hmm. for an engineer, can these be translated into Roslyn analyzers and be made as my productive suite? Have you have you thought about it? Have you done anything around that angle? Yeah, so so there's a there's a tiny principle in the standard that I had to put together, and I'll talk about that in a second. The the principle goes and says like this. Um, you want to be careful and make sure that you're not creating what I call toasters. And what are these toasters? It's basically my way of saying toasters. I'm just referring in the most kind of, you know, warning, you know, way or cautious way to uh, automation. There is good automation and bad energy, like style cops and analyzers, you know, to kind of force engineers to kind of follow a certain standard. There's a problem with that. The problem with that is that the engineers will care less and less about your standard and more about just getting all these bugs and errors that are showing in their visual studio to disappear right so instead of them learning it and owning it and going and implementing it themselves they will go and say oh let me just get this annoying thing to stop kind of bothering me and then we run into situations where they go and do the pragma right they be like okay mm -hmm. this pragma here let me skip let me violate that rule there's two problems with that. If you let the analyzers do it, you're taking a whole lot of opportunity for practice and ownership from the engineers to actually go and implement these principles, right? And when that happens, they leave the project with no idea what the principles was because they now become reliant. It's like, it's like smoking, right? When you start smoking too much and nicotine, your brain stop, you know, kind of producing its own and it's relying on this external source, right? Now, here's the tricky part. Analyzers are not perfect. They're toasters, right? You put the toast in it and they're not perfect, right? So what happens is that you're gonna go and really be uh, pedantic about a certain rule or a certain implementation that they think violates the standard when it doesn't, right? In the past, when I used analyzers and style cups and stuff like that, you know, I came out from the experience with an engineering team that had no idea what the principles were trying to, to implement is, and they cared more about making list bugs and warnings rather than actually understanding. And therefore they never went and taught it to anyone because they're relying on this toaster to do it for them. It's just a little opinionated matter, but I think that there's a good middle ground there, right? There's a good middle ground where you can go and say, maybe these certain things that we know we're not gonna change versus the things that we want people actually to go and do it by hand, because you have to factor in, I want the engineer to go and fix every single iteration because it's, it's, it's going in their mind, they're practicing. There's a human aspect to this. It's not just about getting the code to be clean. It's getting the engineer to be happy and do work and be able to practice it and stuff like that. Agree. There's a middle ground. I agree. Completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Kassil, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. I want to ask a bit more about test-driven development because I tried it in other places and it was very, very difficult. You require uh -huh. certain skills, especially, for example, when you do bug fixing, when you do performance improvements, it doesn't come natural to write a test that fails first and then try to fix it. And then maybe you, you write it and just passes, you know, just write the condition there to pass it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it, it looks like it's, it doesn't come natural. And I'm curious, yes. how did you manage to, to put it in place? Practice and a lot of it, you know, you have to think of, by the way, I don't think of unit tests as 
unit test is a documentation for your code. You're making a proposition. You're going and saying, I need to call the storage broker to, to pass in the student object that I passed into my function. Just something as simple as that, right? However, if you think of it as a documentation, if you think of it as a proposition, right, it becomes second, second nature. Like up until like 15 years ago, 15 years ago, I hated unit tests. I'd be like, this doesn't make any sense. And I can't mock these dependencies. Every time I go mock the entity framework, you know, it kind of bugs out and all that. And then I realized, oh, I'm doing it wrong, right? I need to abstract dependencies. I need to abstract even time as a dependency. And I need to control what's actually happening. Practice a lot of it. In almost 400 videos that I have now, and please, you know, go check out the, the YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. In all of these videos, every single feature was developed in TDD. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that I'm practicing myself, right? I started to bring people from inside Microsoft and we go and say, okay, we're going to be able to, and we start evolutionizing it. And now I have people from all over the world coming in saying, hey, we, we need to evolutionize how we just drive the exception handling, how we're going to do it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think to your point, just like everything else, you know, in our lives, a lot of practice, a lot of pairing, if you're pairing with someone who loves test-driven development, they will make you love it too because you're seeing how much they're passionate about it, right? But if you do it on your own, you're going to get stuck, right? Okay. We're not meant to be sitting alone doing work on our own. We're very social people. No matter how much they say engineers are not social, they're introverted, blah, blah, blah. They say that all the time, right? But if you actually sit down with an engineer with an open heart and mind and you go and say, let's do this together, I'm actually helping you out. You know, I have people in the past said I stopped going to therapy sessions since we started pair programming because I feel like I'm fulfilling this social aspect of my life. I'm talking to people, especially during pandemics, right? Because in the pandemic, everyone got isolated. You don't see your people anymore. You're sitting in the room by yourself. It's horrible, right? But when you start telling people, oh, no, you're going to be with someone and they're dedicated. Their time is dedicated to pair with you for the rest of the day. It doesn't feel like you're asking someone a favor anymore. The senior engineer, literally their job, their success to deliver the features intertwined with your success to succeed with them and finish the task with them. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go so ahead. that's why, that's why you, you put the one person to write the test and the other one to, to. Yeah. And then, they, the and then they aspect. switch. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And, and, and here's the thing. My, my reports are for engineers. We switch like we don't have favorites and besties, right? Oh, like today, okay, okay. like t t today it's Terry and Michael and Gedeka and uh, 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 and Terry, right? I can go tomorrow and say, nope, let's switch that over, right? Now I have Andrew pairing with Gedeka, and then Terry will be, you know, pairing with Mike, and so on and so forth. When you shuffle like this, you know what my team said. One of the things that they said, we said we've been working together for like a year. I don't think we really know each other until we started pairing with people. You don't know someone until you start pairing with them. You know, you could say hi in the hallways and, you know, eat pizza, you know, but you don't know them until you actually sit down, write code with them. And this is when they open up because when engineers are happy, they start writing code. They're going to be like, you know what, man, I'm going on a, this trip to Hawaii, you know, now in your head. Okay. Okay. Kostin likes Hawaii. Right. Yeah. Now I, like I know it. how to surprise Kostin. <laughs> now I know how to do something nice to them. You know what I mean? It yeah, has a very yeah. important social aspect to it, you know? It's not just code, you know? We're a lot more than that. <laughs> it's also fun, right? Uh, at yes. some point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, that's great. That's great. Awesome. So we will ask you for your help when we do the pair programming and test-driven development. Absolutely. Please reach out. You know, I do this with a lot of organizations across Microsoft. They come and say, how did you do this pair programming thing? Imagine you going to work and it's not just your weight to carry. It's your weight and Andre. So me going to work, I'll be like, oh, Andre and I are going to solve this problem together. You know, have you ever been in a situation where you when you are dealing with something big, like a big trouble that you're dealing with, but you find like three other people that are dealing with the exact same trouble? It makes it feel a little bit less. So it's not yeah. just me. Same thing with pair programming. We're social beings. Let's just factor that in and let's just bring happiness, prosperity, and hope into our engineering team and watch the productivity go to the moon. Watch people are just, because even, here's the thing, even if you know all the answers, you're still going to get kind of, you know, oh, I'm doing it by myself. I have to do all this work. But if you know someone is waiting for you in a meeting to pair with them, work is going to get done. Yeah. I think that, that's, that's a great thing, you know, and I think you should be, advertise a bit more yeah not not sit in a 
in a silo <laughs> there, you know. <laughs> I, I, I really think everyone should try it. Uh, should adapt. Absolutely. Yeah. Please consider, take, you know, t have me spend the day with you and your team okay. and I'll yeah. bring someone, yeah. I'll show, I'll show you how to do, how to do pair programming. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. I had someone here at Microsoft has been working here for over 20 years, right? And he started pair programming with me for the first time, you know, and he said to me, this is nice. I love this a lot. I was like, I didn't expect you to say that because you know all the answers, right? He's a principal guy, right? He said, no, 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 I love this a lot. This is perfect. Why are, why haven't I been doing this for a long, long time? You know what I mean? So, you know, let's, yeah. let's, let's practice. Let's action on it. Just don't, don't let this, don't let this speech just be something nice that you heard one day and then you just pass by it. This could revolutionize and change your engineering career forever, forever. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's about building trust. It's about uh, letting yourself be vulnerable because yeah. maybe you're not uh, writing the best code as Andre, or maybe I'm not, you know. So, I mean, having this openness, then I'm I'm open myself to to improve my yeah. right in yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Important. Here's the thing: you're not gonna bring your engineering team together with ping pong tables and pizza parties. Have them write <laughs> code together, and now you're building a real team. Yeah, okay. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much. That's that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. All right. <laughs> We're 10 minutes over. Andrew, anything from you before I uh, go on this hackathon thing? <laughs> no, uh, it was a great, great session. Thank you very much. And for sure, we'll keep in touch. Maybe we have another session targeted yeah. on pair, pair programming. I, I heard uh, some of our team colleagues want to know more about uh, all data, and we yep. know that uh, you are responsible for it. So yep. let's keep in touch. And again, thank you very much. It was a great session. Absolutely. Thank you all so very much. I appreciate you all. Uh, Take care. Uh, I think Kostin has. So oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I was just clapping. I tried to clap. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Clap. okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, yeah. guys. Absolutely, Take care. Guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.